Hello, everybody. Welcome to the next discussion. It's great to see you in, in big numbers. It's uh, difficult to compete with Just Stone, but uh, I'm happy to see you here. Uh, we'll be focusing on uh, economy, economic inequality in this discussion. Uh, I have a great honor to welcome here two wonderful guests. Uh, one of them is John Perkins, uh, famous American author. John is the author of a famous bestseller, uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Uh, uh, this book uh, was published in 2004. It raised uh, a lot of uh, reactions, uh, positive, negative. Uh, it has been translated into 32 or, or even more languages. Uh, it has been lectured now uh, at universities like Oxford, uh, Cambridge uh, in the US. Uh, uh, Giving his perspective on uh, uh, this subject uh, will be also Tomasz Sedlacek. I don't know whether I should uh, introduce him. Uh, everybody knows Tomasz Sedlacek, uh, famous economist, uh, author of uh, Economy of Good and Evil, bestseller, translated also into uh, different languages. Uh, Thomas is uh, uh, chief microeconomic advisor with Chair Sobe and uh, former advisor to Václav Havel and many other institutions. Uh, I'm happy to have, uh, to have everybody uh, on stage. I will read a quote from John Perkins' uh, book, uh, published in 2004, just to introduce the theme. Economic hitmen are highly paid professionals who cheat countries around the globe out of trillions of dollars. They funnel money from the World Bank, the US Agency for International Development, and other foreign aid organizations into the coffers of huge corporations and the pockets of a few wealthy families who control the planet's natural resources. Their tools include fraudulent financial reports, rigged elections, payoffs, extortion, sex, and murder. They play an, a game as an old empire, but one that has taken on a new and terrifying dimensions during this time of globalization. I should know I was one of them. That's John per Perkins in Confessions of an Economic Hitman. John, let's start with your subject. Well, thank you. Wow. Thanks so much for that introduction, and thank you for sharing the stage with me, and all of you for being here at this incredible, incredible Colors of Ostrava. It's a fantastic festival. Um, yeah, so I was an economic hitman. I have to confess. Uh, and my real title was chief economist at a major international consulting firm out of the United States. Uh, my job was really to uh, identify countries, poor countries, third world countries, with resources our corporations wanted, like oil or gas, and then arrange a huge loan. Is this mic working okay? Yeah. Then a louder. Okay, better, okay. Arrange a huge loan to countries with resources our corporations wanted, but from the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund, but the money never actually went to the country. Instead, it went to our own corporations uh, to build big infrastructure projects in the country, things like electric systems and industrial parks and highways and ports, things that made huge profits for our companies and for a few wealthy families in the countries, the families that owned the industries and that owned the banks and the financial institutions. But as the, our corporations made lots of money and a few wealthy families benefited, everybody else suffered because money was diverted from health care and education and other social services to pay the interest on the loans. And in the end, the country couldn't pay back its loans. And so we'd go back into the country and say, hey, since you can't pay your loans, uh, 
sell your resource, your oil, or your gas, or whatever, real cheap to our corporations without any environmental or social regulations, or let us build a military base on your soil, or vote with us at the United Nations in the next critical vote. And in a few instances where presidents of countries or the leaders of countries didn't accept these loans, when I went to the, to the presidents and said what we're going to do for you, um, then people we call the jackals came in. And they either overthrew governments or assassinated them. And unfortunately, I have to say that my country, the United States, has gone on record of having assassinated or overthrown President Mossadegh of Iran, President Arbenz of Guatemala, um, Lumumba of the Congo, Diem from Vietnam, Allende of Chile, and many others. Two of my clients, the President of Ecuador, Jaime Roldos, and the Head of State of Panama, Omar Torrijos, both went down in terrible plane crashes. They were assassinations because they wouldn't buy the deal. And so this was a process of creating an empire, a global empire. And it's not so much an American empire as a corporate empire that was supported by the US government and the sorts of things that I did. But um, it has, in fact, created an economic system that's failing us all today. So we have an economic system that I call a death economy that's come out of this. And it's based, this death economy is based on this approach that's the economic hitman and also on a philosophy that was espoused in 1976. There was a moment in history, a very important moment, that changed everything. And that was the moment when Milton Friedman won the Nobel Prize in Economics. And he's very important in the Czech Republic, I know, because your Dr. Klaus, who was very instrumental in this economy, was a student of Milton Friedman's, and, and uh, von Hayek, Frederick von Hayek, who won the Nobel Prize a few years before Friedman. Their contention was that the only job of business is to maximize short-term profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. It was a terrible idea. It had been growing over time, but when I went to business school before that, I was taught that you should pay a good rate of return to investors, but also be socially responsible. Also be responsible to your communities. That all changed in 1976, and it's changed ever since. And it's created this economic catastrophe that we have globally now, where we know that the glaciers are melting, the oceans are rising. We have climate change. There's no question about that. And we have species going extinct. And we have the fear of nuclear holocaust. And we have a huge divide between the very rich and everybody else. Things have, we've seen amazing miracles in my lifetime, in medicine, in science, in the arts. We've seen incredible things happen that way. We've seen infant mortality rates around the world go down and life expectancies go up. We've seen terrible diseases being cured. We've seen more people connected to water and sewage and electricity. And at the same time, we've seen the potential for absolute catastrophe. Climate change that might be irreversible. Nuclear holocaust and their growing problems of terrorism that come out of the separation between the wealthy and the poor and desperation. And so we've created this death economy. And it's an economic system that is based on militarization to a large degree and on destroying, killing the very resources upon which it depends. We know that it's a catastrophe, but the good news is we're all waking up to it. It's why you're here. And so it's time for us to move into a life economy. And this is an economic system that's based on cleaning up pollution regenerating destroyed environments and new technologies that recycle, that don't dig up the earth. It's a tremendous opportunity that we have, and I would just like to share with you, and we have the first slide, Peter, please. Ah, well. So, a death economy maximizes short-term profits. It's predatory. It exploits people, the environment, and other businesses. It buys other businesses and drives them out of business, destroys resources, 
It values extractive and materialistic things above life quality. So teachers don't get paid very much. Artists don't get paid very much. But the people who destroy the earth, the big entrepreneurs, the big investors, they get paid a lot. It ignores externalities. It doesn't assign costs to the pollution that's caused by digging for oil or producing coal or whatever. That's, an exter that's known as an externality. It's based on militarization. And environmental collapse comes out of this income inequality and often political instability. Taxes are considered to be bad rather than looked at as investments. Imagine if we looked at taxes as investments. So I'd have to say in the United States, my taxes are investments in killing people because the military is such a huge part of our budget. If we looked at it that way, we might, the American people might say, no, I want to invest in education and health care. But no, no, we call that taxes. So we need to change these terms. And essentially, the death economy is undemocratic. It's controlled by a few very, very wealthy people. And it's today the dominant form of capitalism. Capitalism is a tricky subject. It's not all bad, but what we have today is bad, what I call predatory capitalism. Now, a life economy, on the other hand, maximizes long-term benefits not just profits, but benefits for everyone. In fact, it pays people decent rates of return, investors, to invest in things that clean up pollution. So it's all about cooperation. It values the quality of life activities. It pays teachers and social workers and artists and writers well. It, re it cleans up pollution, regenerates environments, and it includes externalities and the cost that we pay for things. It looks at, it, at taxes as investments. It's democratic. It includes cooperatives and for-benefit corporations. I'm not sure what the status of those are here in Czechoslovakia, but they're growing, excuse me, in the Czech Republic, but they're growing extensively in other parts of the world. It supports jobs that enrich life, teachers and artists. So imagine, I like to think, what if my tax money went to pay the companies that are currently making tanks, missiles, guns? What if instead Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, uh, Raytheon, what if we paid them to come up with equipment and to, instead of killing people, to mine all the plastic that's floating in the ocean and to clean up all the oil spills around the world, around every oil site, around every gas station and recycle all of that. There's a tremendous opportunity here for a whole new economic system, a life economy. And the only thing it's going to take to change that is perception. How much time do I have? There's two realities in the world, simply put. There's objective reality, this microphone. Perceived reality what I'm speaking through the microphone. And almost every human activity is controlled by perceived reality. So there is no Czech Republic. There is no United States. There's no Russia. There's no corporations. There's no religion. There's no culture, except as we perceive it. And when enough people accept a perception or make it into law, it has a huge impact on objective reality. And so we had this perception. In 1976, it was codified into law, essentially, that the only responsibility of corporations is to maximize short-term profits, regardless of the social and environmental costs. That's a perception. It's not a fact. Well, all we need to do OK, so that's the death economy perception. All we need to do is change the perception and say that the goal of business, the goal of life, is to invest in things that profit the public sector, that clean up pollution, that benefit life, that regenerate the environment, that recycle that new technologies. So we invest in long-term futures for ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. And incidentally, before I was an economic hitman, I was a Peace Corps volunteer deep in the Amazon rainforest. 
I've spent a lot of time with indigenous people. I still do. I go every year. I take groups of people to learn from indigenous cultures because indigenous cultures, which we all come from, our ancestors, every one of them has life economies. They have economic systems. They recognize that the importance is the long term, not the short term, the long term, the protection of resources. And we take people to learn. I hope many of you will come with me. I take people into the Amazon, and I take in, in December, during the terrible months here in the Czech Republic, December, January, February, you can come with me either to the Amazon or to the Kogi people of Colombia or the Maya of Guatemala or people in Costa Rica. Go to my website, johnperkins.org, sign up, come, and you'll see these people firsthand, live with them, hang out with them. It's an amazing experience. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's advertising. I'm a good capitalist. <laughs> but that's part of the life economy, actually. And I have to say, so if we can move into this life economy, it's not a difficult thing. It's a change of perception and a change of how we do things. And I just want to say that right here, this place where we're at today, is an incredible symbol because what we see all around us is part of a death economy. Coal, steel, and it went bankrupt because it used up all its resources, which is happening to the whole world now on a much slower basis. And now what you have here is a life economy. We're all here having a great time listening to wonderful music. Uh, we're investing in spirituality. We're investing in intellectuality. We're hearing great speakers. We're thinking, we're communicating, we're getting together. This is the life economy, and it's sprung right out of the death economy. This is a beautiful, beautiful symbol. I think this whole country, Czech Republic, is an amazing symbol because you've risen from the ashes of the Nazis, the ashes of the Soviet Union, and look what you've got today, an amazing country. I'm so happy to be here with you and, and to see this firsthand. So the opportunity is for us to move into a life economy, and all it takes is that change of perception. And so I'm going to stop talking and, and let, um, I think this is supposed to be a debate, so, so I'm, going to, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm going to let Tomas tell me that really what we want to do is stay in the death economy. Because I, he and I, we, we drank some beer together last night, and I know we agree on most everything, so I don't think we're going to debate too much, but he'll probably be, maybe he'll try. But I want to leave you with what you can do. So every one of us, it's going to take every one of us to participate in this because the leaders don't want to change it. Trump doesn't want a life economy. Putin doesn't want a life economy. Your leaders don't want a life, your newly elected prime minister and your president, they don't want a life economy. They're happy with what they've got. I'm yelling too loud. Uh, so <laughs> it's going to take off. I get very excited about this. <laughs> I am excited. <laughs> Thank you. We're in. Yeah, we're having a consciousness revolution on this planet right now. People are waking up. I speak in many different places. I, about a year ago, I was speaking with President Putin at the St. Petersburg, Russia International Economic Forum. He was there. I was there. We were, yeah, anyway. And, and a little while before that, I was on the stage with Lady Gaga and Yoko Ono. And that's a big difference. <laughs> um, so it's going to take all of us together to make this happen. So what can you do? First of all, every one of you has a dream. You have something you really want to do, your heart's desire, your bliss. I don't know what it is, but I know every one of you has it. For me, it's writing. I didn't enjoy being an economic hitman. I, I thought I did. I was getting really well paid. I was meeting with presidents. I was flying first class. I was having an amazing time, I thought, and I was taking a lot of Valium and drinking a lot of alcohol. I was unhappy. I didn't know it because, for a while because that's what I've been taught in business school to do. Now, now I get to hang out with people like all of you. And I don't take Valium anymore. When in the Czech Republic, I do drink beer. Because the water is too expensive. <laughs>
<laughs> and the beer is so darn good. Okay, so define your dream. Mine is writing. Mine is writing, writing, talking, speaking out. And then describe how your dream can support a life economy. So for a writer, it's about writing about supporting a life economy. And you should do this on three levels, the personal, professional, sphere of influence. So uh, I can say for me, part number three, put it in writing every day. Now write down what your dream is. Like for me, I will recycle, be less materialistic. And then from a professional standpoint, I'll write and speak about the life economy supporting stories. And in the sphere of influence, I'll use social media and other venues to inspire. But whatever you do, if you're a carpenter and you love carpentry, then make a commitment to make, to build things out of sustainable materials. And you will speak out about that. You will tell your clients, the people you're building houses for, that that's what you're doing. And it might cost a little bit more, but it's invest an investment in your children's, in their children's future and you can spread that word. So whatever you do, whatever your heart's desire is, you can tie it into this life economy. So that's the third thing, put that in writing. Make it brief. And the fourth thing is every single morning, get up and give yourself a little prayer. You know, I will do this. You can pick one of them or all three. And then take daily actions to make it happen. So for a writer, I have to write every day. Books don't write themselves, unfortunately. No, it's not unfortunate, because I like to write. So define your dream. See how it supports a life economy. Three, put it in writing, what you can do to realize your dream and support a life economy. Four, read that statement every morning. And five, take daily actions to make it happen. And I'm going to end my part of the talk here with a with a quote from the Dalai Lama. So a few years ago, I took a group of people, let me see what we got, oh, oh yeah, so on my new, so on my, uh, go to my website and sign up for one of the trips. <laughs> and sign up for the newsletter, and if you don't remember those five points, they're gonna be in my next newsletter, which will come out in about three weeks. I do a newsletter once a month. So a few years ago, I took a group of people to meet with the Dalai Lama at his home in Dhamsala, India. We're a small group of people. We had the privilege of spending an afternoon in his living room. And one of the people asked the Dalai Lama a question. He said, you know, there's a writer in the United States, it wasn't me, there's a writer in the United States who is suggesting that everybody all over the world take 10 minutes off on a certain day at a certain time and pray for peace. What do you think of that, your holiness? And the Dalai Lama said, hmm, praying for peace, meditating on peace, that's a great idea. You should do it. But if it's the only thing you do, it's a waste of time. And it may be counterproductive because if you pray for peace and you walk away and say, I've done my job, that's a big mistake. Pray for peace, meditate on peace, and every single day take daily action to make peace happen. I think that's so important for all of us. So see yourself, your own dream in life, your goal, as part of your prayer. You get up every morning, you read that, you're praying to yourself, I will do such and such to create a life economy, and then take the actions to make it happen. And together, we and all the other audiences that we talk to around the world, whether they're in Russia or China, I've spoken in China, the United States, everywhere, there's people coming together and recognizing that we live on a very, very fragile space station, the Earth, and we're navigating it toward disaster. We have to reboot the navigational system. And that means converting a death economy into a life economy and having a hell of a good time doing it because you gotta do what you really enjoy or you're never successful. So let's have fun and create a life economy. Are you ready to do that? Are you ready? All right, look forward to doing it with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you.
So Master Lachik has been making many notes. So let's go ahead. Yeah. Um, we, we, we here in, in, in Slavic languages, we have fairy tales and law and in that you need to, when something goes foul, you need to give the entity first dead water, then it disassembles, but it, pieces of the body come apart. And after only then may you apply the living water. So uh, I'm wondering, you, you called it uh, reboot. Yeah, if we had talked about this 200 years, you would have maybe said uh, revival. Uh, John Maynard Keynes talks about a new Adam being born. A new Adam, for those of you who uh, understand a little bit, this is a very deeply religious term. Jesus Christ used to refer to himself as the second Adam. Adam means human in, in Hebrew. So John Stuart Mill, the biggest economist of the last century, whether one agrees with him or not, is now irrelevant. Um, but he was the brightest thinker uh, of, of, or the economist that people actually will remember if they ask, if they're being asked for one. This very serious man goes into very goofy subjects like a new Adam. And this new Adam was to be born, so maybe your prophecy is timely. Because in 1930, John Maynard Keynes had a speech which then later was turned into a um, paper. And uh, somehow the topic was economic possibilities of our grandchildren. And he said that he believes that not in his lifetime, not in, the, in, not in the lifetime of our children, but in the lifetime of our grandchildren, about 100 years from now, which is 2030, Mankind will go through reboot, uh, re resurrection, um, repentance, uh, and a new Adam will be born. A, 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 an ent a human being will finally have the time to do what human being was always supposed to do, which is to do this. And labor will be rendered irrelevant. Uh, we will be so rich, so affluent, and he actually d doesn't even include the technology that's been completely changed. Um, he doesn't even know about the technological change. He only expects the growth of GDP as it has grown in the previous years. He simply extrapolates. So he says, okay, provided there will be no wars, sooner or later, in about 100 years, the economy will change itself. Also, ethics will become very cheap because just imagine that just for one dollar uh, one percent of your income I could make all the world hunger go away and, and make sure that none of this happens and there is no need really to burn places that can't be re rebuilt again etc so it, it's actually is possible um, so um, uh, so labor will be something of a past so, uh, so what I'm trying to say is that we have these, uh, the yearnings of the spirit. I'm also going to use a very religious uh, terminology because uh, I, the way I look at the structure of the society is I look at it like a body, soul, and spirit. So, well, you just, I, just yesterday I had a wonderful debate. I was bothering somebody who was willing to listen about I have a list of non-existing entities. And you can try to make one as well, but these non-existing entities are usually the ones that influence our lives the most. For example, the future. That's a very good example of non-existing entity and, and, and the past, etc., etc., etc. So I look at one non-existing entity through the lens of many other non-existing entities just to make it a little bit more clear. Is I want to make... So the body is the economy, the actual tractor, the beer that you're drinking, the, 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 the body, the corpus the body in the physical term. The uh, soul would be knowledge uh, or law. Law also doesn't exist, but it's a vital substructure of, of the society. Even here w between us, we have some agreement. For example, we have an agreement that we will not physically attack. This is actually something that we didn't even have to agree on because it's so bluntly obvious, right? Until it isn't. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> But um, what I'm saying is that I try to look at, and then there is the spirit. Now, spirit is the most difficult part to grasp, given the name. That's why they, I, I suppose, often describe it as a wind. 
Now, spirit of the society. Now, if I ask you, what is the spirit of Czech Republic? What, what is, is the spirit sad or what does it want to do? What bothers it? It's a quite an interesting um, thing to, to think. So now, what is the spirit of economics? So I'm going through all sorts of literature that speak about subjects like this. And it's, we always wanted, from Adam Smith started, we all, Adam Smith wrote his Wealth of Nations so that he would teach the poor nations to be richer so that they could be ethically sounder because he noticed that it's only poor people who actually you know, go into dangers to risk their life to save their kids from, 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 from dying. So, and now my point is, I think the soul, the spirit is ready. But the, but the, but the body is not. And this is the problem of economics. We, are, we, are, we don't want to fight e each other here in Czech Republic. You don't want to fight your neighbors over politics, over stupid issues. But we do. And um, uh, there, is this, there is this yearning for, for a nice economy and for peace between brothers and for peaceful politics. But it never actually materializes. So um, I think the problem, to conclude, I think the problem here is intellectual. I think the situation of, of which we are in is that the spirit doesn't know what to yearn. That's also one way why all these conservatives, exactly the opponents of your vision, are coming back to power because people are, we didn't, let's just say, intellectuals or leaders or visionaries or artists or performers or hipsters. Yeah, maybe hipster is a good description of the situation. And this is not a critique of hipster. I'm a little bit also today like a hipster. Uh, and I've heard somewhere that Jesus was himself a Pharisee, and that's a theory that I quite like, that he was criticizing, in fact, his own, in his own sort of belief structure. But, but hipster, I think, in my definition, is somebody who... Well, let me put it this way. When I was young, we had anarchists, we had communists, we had hippies. I was a hippie, we, hippies were the best, we got trams, we got movements, we got all sorts of very violent youth movements that really, really literally crashed things and it was punkers and punk people and, and others or metal people and it was a very strong critique of the mainstream. Now we have hipsters, which I think don't like the mainstream but are very sitting very close to it. So. I think we need a new vision for the, for, for, for the world. What happened is that postmodernity went, uh, I think in postmodernity, the Western spirit has sort of gone back in circles and we don't know where to go from now. So let's say 30 years ago, postmodernity for me was a very nice sort of intellectual movement because it destroyed and dismantled and deconstructed everything we had and there were really no values and and everything is subjective perception so what's happening now this postmodern feeling tripled down to uh, the sun and popular uh, boulevard media yeah, fake news that's what philosophers been talking about for for, for, for for decades now the problem is that this deconstruction did not lead to any intellectual construction. We, in fact, don't know where to carry the world forward. We're not really sure. We're very hazy. Communists knew. Nazis knew. I mean, um, just knowing doesn't mean that it's necessarily a good direction. But they knew. Whereas the society of a postmodern era is like... If Einstein came and he destroyed Newtonian physics, which he sort of did, he showed that it doesn't actually apply always. So just imagine that Einstein would have had come and destroyed and said, Newton actually doesn't really hold. It's not a good theory. It's a crap theory. But I'm not going to tell you the right solution. Yeah. Or, or he just didn't think of a better solution. So maybe one of the problems here in economics is that we do not have Einstein. We do not have somebody who actually takes the whole system and reverts it upside down and says, we shouldn't use prices in negotiation. We should value people according to their contribution to the society instead of their contribution to a company. Uh, but we simply don't know uh, how, to, how, to, how to talk about it. So the society needs a new heart, new spirit. With that, I agree. I think that's easier done than the, than the, uh, the institutions, uh, customs, habits, laws, and all the things that are invisible but shake our life. So that's just um, an introductory. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the debate with you especially. 
and also you. John, you've mentioned this symbolic setting of Ostrava, of, uh, of an old mine, you know, the, as a symbol of uh, death and life, economy, whatever. For some people, for some of your critics, it also may be a symbol of a big dream uh, that has been established in Czechoslovakia and in the Soviet Union, you know, let's take the wealth uh, from the super wealthy and let's give it to the people or whatever. Uh, I mean, what do you respond to your critics? Uh, there, are, there is a harsh criticism of your theory as being too holistic, too simplistic, uh, reminding uh, some kind of communism that Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic experienced as something, as a disaster. Uh, there's also, there are some elements of uh, criticism coming, uh, uh, you know, that some parts of your theories remind like the Russian propaganda, you know, so, uh, United States as a, as a evil, you know, full of uh, corporate banks and US government, whatever. So my question is, what, do you res what is your reply to this critis uh, to criticism and my question to Thomas, would you agree, agree with some elements of this criticism or is it something you don't, you don't agree? Um, gee, I didn't realize there was any criticism. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, well, you know, I, I think the, the, the truth of the matter is that people around the world are waking up to the fact that the system isn't working. So to criticize a, a non-functional system is sort of a no-brainer. Uh, and, and as I said earlier, we have had amazing things come out of this system. Um, incredible technology, science, medicine, art, and so on. But always you have a system that comes up and at some point it reaches its peak and then it starts to go into decline. And it can either completely go into the decline and collapse, which that, that could happen, global warming, if we keep going, it's probably going to take us into collapse. Or, when you reach this point, you can decide to take a new course. And that's what I'm advocating here. I'm not advocating a, a huge change of the system, something like what the Soviets were advocating. I'm advocating that we move into, we continue with investors. We can continue even with the same corporations. As I said, let people invest in, in Lockheed Martin, but instead of building warplanes, let them build equipment that will clean up uh, destroyed environments. You had, as I understand it, you had some big mines here that have been filled in and, and homes or buildings have been built on them. It's things like that. That can be done in so many parts of the world. There's so many places in the, in the world that have been badly devastated by industrialization and by climate change. We can spend a lot of, we can hire a lot of people and investors can make money investing in cleaning these things up, we can create a whole new economy. So it's not a question of, of bad-mouthing the old system, and certainly not the United States. I'm a very loyal American, actually. Uh, my, my heritage goes back over 300 years, and, and my, my ancestors fought in the American Revolution and every war since practically until Vietnam, and not in the recent ones. But I think that the United States needs to recognize that we took a leadership role up to a point, and I think we've, we've dropped that leadership role in some respects now. We've dropped the moral leadership, and, and I would like to see us regain it by, by taking a leadership and moving into this life economy. I, I travel around the United States all the time. I talk on television, I talk on radio, I write books, because I want to see my country take a leadership role in that. And I would like to say to Czechoslovakia, I said Czech Republic, I'm sorry, I keep doing that, I'm, I'm, I'm old school. The Czech Republic, I'd like to say, don't let the United States be the leader. Let the Czech Republic be the leader. And let's tell, the, to, let's tell the Brazilians to be the leaders. Let's, we just had a World Cup in football. Let's have a World Cup in what country can become the leader in creating a life economy and providing that leadership. Wouldn't that be wonderful to have that World Cup? So I think what we're talking about here is not, not destroying an old system, but using the old system as a springboard to move into a whole new type of system. Right. 
Thomas. Well, the fact, the, the fact is that the world uh, is in the need of a change. Our textbooks have been written in the pre-internet world, and they haven't still sort of took notice of that. It's funny. Sociology already sociologists have rewritten their books because internet changed a lot of things. You know, uh, uh, unless you're an economist. And, 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 and there are whole bubbles created on the internet and the whole the economy is moving to the internet. We are departing from the biological bodies into a whole new set. The world is truly becoming, we in a couple of decades, we are to become a civilization type one because all the way till now, 2018, we are all of us in it together. We are a civilization type zero because we haven't even connected with, with ourselves around. This is, this is, um, Kardashev scale, uh, and which is used in physics to rank uh, levels of, of civilization. But for an economist or for a politician or thinker, this means that within a couple of decades, if we are to believe physicists and those pretend to come up with nice, very often functional things, that uh, the planet will change, that we will need to start talking about uh, uh, planetary democracy, for example. We still have uh, uh, very national, this is another, as you rightly put, national and non-existing entity. And certain things, such as you suggested, will only work if all nations do them at once, or at least, let's say, a huge majority of nations do them as one. Um, this was, this was, the, this was um, uh, I don't know whether I should go into Marxism right now, but, um, uh, but let me just say that, that what you said, John, is this isn't really a, a critique, of, and, I, and you never said it this way, but it's not a critique of capitalism. Uh, you know, it's a critique of um, misusing your position. So what you describe and, and what you did as a, a hitman was, uh, you know, it was just mean people doing mean things to disadvantage people. You could have done that under communist regime. You could have done that under anarchy. You could have done that under some maybe, well, maybe hippie paradise wouldn't do thing. But even, you know, in a bang of hippies or in a kibbutzim, you could, do, you could even do this without money, you know. You can even do it without banks. You can even do it without paper agreements signed by, by, by lawyers. So, so, and this is, I think, very often, I, 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 uh, and this is not the case, but while I'm at the subject, Marx didn't really, when you read it carefully, he didn't really, he was saying he was criticizing capitalism, but he wasn't really, at the end of the day, criticizing capitalism. He was criticizing industrialization. That's what according to Marx, cripples and belittles human beings and alienates him. Uh, it's, it's this strange feeling of alienation from, you know, the worker no longer feels attached to his product. I, I, well, anyway, I must always be careful to be, because those are all interesting subjects. And uh, So Marx's criticism was maybe criticism of heavy ur urbanization, change of family style. It was, it was that sort of a critique that then led to... Camp communism adopting the most brutal forms of industrialization, much more brutal than in, in, in Western world. Let's look at the environment for starters. Let's look at the longevity of people who lived in Mordor. Um, uh, so, so, so we must be careful here uh, what, we are, what we are criticizing. It's, um, it's um, an example, for example. A situation where one country is a poor country and they can produce one kilo of coffee for one unit. We live in a rich country where we are ready to pay 100 units for a kilo of, of coffee. Now these two countries start trading. Suddenly they get a ship there. Now, where do you think the price should be? So just to take it a little bit slower, if the price is 50 units, the seller gets 50 the poor uh, coffee producing image that I have, and we checks, we will save 50 units because we can use those 50 units to buy other things. Huh? So we share the 100 units or 99 units of wealth, of newly discovered wealth, somehow. Now, where would you think the price should, there's the word should, this is a normative question, where do you think the price should be? If the price is of the price of the, the agreed price of the coffee, let's say that we agree on, on 90 uh, or 80 units. That would mean that the poor, ga poor man gains 79 units and we gain 20. Okay? So according to where the price ends, we'll determine how we cut the, 
the joy, the jouissance, the, the, we call it profit. So where do you think the price should be? Should it be 50 up to advantage the poor guy for him to gain the wealth of the rich country faster? It, the price would have to be 50 and more. And it should be. Uh, it should be the rich, the poor, peop, pro, poor person gaining more from the trade than the rich, than the rich person. Okay, but the price is very close to one unit zero zero one cents. Why? Because we, and, and for that you don't need even capitalism, not even common, it's just simple relate exchanging between human beings. Now the price is set by market mechanisms. The price is set according to logic that we don't have to go into now, the price will be set very advantageously, advantageously for the rich country, we will gain, our coffee will now cost only one, one dollar. Uh, and we will ga gain 19, and this poor guy will, it's also voluntary, it's also advantages for him, but he only gets a very, very small share of that. If we could fix this problem of price versus value, we are set. Okay, so if there was some way how to make sure that the price is at least 50 or up so that the poor guy gains more than the rich guy loses. Uh, sorry, not even that, not rich guy loses, rich guy gains. So the poor guy would, both of them are gaining, but the rich guy is gaining more. So this is why you see uh, the, the scissors going up, but the lower part of the blade is also going up. Okay, so yes, the riches are becoming richer, but also the poor are becoming poorer. So, um, so these are the sort of things that we, that we need to do. I think we need to study the system. I think we need to understand the system. I, um, I, I, I think education here is paramount. Yesterday I was li uh, listening to um, uh, speakers here talk about quantum mechanics and about consciousness and how to, how to, how to make influence on the world. And there were all these sort of, you know, very much like hipster suggestions, you know, like become influence, influencer on, on social media and, and, you know, send positive energy and make a, make a nice wish and repeat it very often. And I was thinking to myself deep down, sorry to say, where, where is studying the subject that you want to change? Where is studying a subject that you love? Where is spending years and years and years reading books that are sometimes boring until it catches your breath and your spirit leads you to a discovery of Einsteinian kind? Because Einstein didn't just send around likes. You know, he actually disconnected himself from non-existing social media, so he wasn't tempted. Maybe if Einstein lived today, he would have come up with a new version of Pokemon. Thomas? Let's give uh, some floor to questions. Uh, are there any questions? Do we have a microphone? While we're getting, while we're getting the microphone there, I'd, I'd just like to add that when I was doing the economic hitman work, uh, I was believing that it was the right thing to do at the beginning because the classic economic model tells you that if you want to help a poor country, you invest a lot of money into infrastructure, power plants and industry. And statistically, you can show that the economy does increase. So I believe that. It's what I learned in business school. It's what the World Bank teaches. But over time, I began to see that it's very skewed because the rich really are the economy. So for example, right now in the United States, you've got three people who have as much wealth as half the people of the United States. So if those three people are doing really well and the, the bottom half of the United States isn't doing well, is going down, the economy still looks like it's going up because the rich are doing so well. And so I began to see that although the model statistically looks good, invest in heavy infrastructure, the economy grows. But, and, and yes, the poor people get wealthier too, but the wealthier get a lot wealthier. Yeah, exactly. So that's just what you were saying. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, okay, Mr. Parkins. Um, I thank you for the presentation. I read a book uh, from a socialist, uh, uh, socialist preacher, uh, Noam Chomsky, and uh, I feel uh, it's very similar to what you are telling us today. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that uh, your uh, opinion on economy uh, is legitimate, uh, that we have a life economy or death economy. I don't believe because there is a functioning market, uh, market system. 
there is, uh, it's working. Uh, the problem is different. The problem is greed. It's incredible greed of uh, uh, some uh, elites, of people. There is no problem of the system, of the economy. It's market uh, working system. The problem is greed. Just one word, nothing more. Well, I, I, so when we look at the goal of business is to maximize profit regardless of social and environmental costs, we're really talking about greed. But greed is not a human characteristic. And I can say that with a lot of uh, experience because I spent a lot of time in indigenous cultures. Hunters and gatherers, people in the Amazon, people in the Andes, people in the Himalayas. They're not greedy. They're oriented toward taking care of their, their families and, and the community. So I don't accept that greed as a, as a basic human quality. But greed has been completely written into our system. And that's, that's what Milton Friedman was advocating. That's what our, our current business goal is set at, is to maximize short-term consumer gain for a few shareholders, regardless of social and environmental costs, regardless of the, of the destruction it's doing to future generations. That's greed. And it is ingrained now in the system of business that we have. But that's just a perception. It's not a human value. It's not inherently human. And we can change it by changing the perception. Would you be then happy if the business of business would be long-term uh, benefit? Well, long-term benefit for everyone, long-term benefit for life, for the earth. It's not, and it shouldn't just be humans because we, have, we don't know so, what it means. So we, we, if we destroy our environment, then what's that, what does that do so, for humans? So the key is, and I hear quite agree with you, the key is to make sure that uh, we spontaneously or put it somehow in the system, I don't know, tax incentives or something, how to, um, I'm just now selling my unicycle to a friend of mine, so it's very difficult to do a business with your friend because, you know, I don't want to make him any money, so, but it's, it's a difficult task. So my deal was, okay, you know what, I'll do it this way. You have it for months, you pay me the money, and if you don't like it, we switch, switch it back. So is there a system how to make the society, A, long-term, and B, communal, so it's not just willingness of living uh, of, of one family. Is this the task? Yes, I, 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 absolutely. The, so the task is to, is to look at the law. So in, in essence, what we're talking about is creating an economic, and it's really more than economic, it's social, political. It's a system that is itself a renewable resource. So as we, as we use up resources, we renew them. And, and or we don't use resources. So that's what you've done here. You, you haven't torn down all these buildings, destroyed them. You're using them. You're, 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 you're reusing them, basically. You're recycling them. Uh, and throughout the world, we see where uh, shopping malls are just abandoned sometimes or torn down and whole new ones are built up where what you really could do is recycle the materials in, in the old ones. Yeah, if, I, if I may just add a small thing to the gentleman who said that, I think, I, think, I think you said it quite rightly, and I think I was trying to say a little bit similar something with that this actually Marx's critique wasn't actually a critique of capitalism, but you would probably say agreed, and, I, and I, would, I would agree with you. So it's interesting because I really don't think that the fault is in the system so much. Let's, let's make a mental exercise. Let's imagine two countries that have exactly the same system of market democracy, just like, for example, Czech Republic or Netherlands, doesn't matter. Country B has also exactly the same laws of market capitalism or democracy, but one country has democratic culture and economic culture. Basically, people are uh, like, I don't know, films or maybe elves. They're actually nice to each other and they don't go after, they're not greedy. They don't go after each other's throw there be happy if you come up after a year that you're not really happy with the trousers that you feel cheated she would very happily return you the money that would be a very happy country to live only good presidents would be elected uh, only doctors would be respected etc 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 now country number b same laws but full of mean uncultured idiots people who go after each other's throats Will there be a noticeable difference between these two countries? Yes. 
but they have the same law. So if you have, I mean, in country B, in the bad country, the de it, it could be easily voted that they sh we should hang all the redheads because statistically speaking, we are more charming than, than, the, than the rest. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so if there be only 10% of us, 90% of the rest would very easily, and that would be a demo, oh, no, it would be actually, without the quote and unquote, that would be a democratic decision. A democratic decision doesn't mean that it's a good decision. It just means that most people agree on it. Okay. So, uh, I, I really do think that, the, that, 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 that um, yeah, and I mean, just adding to, to the point that we need to build, like we are used to talk about uh, the culture of democracy, uh, we should be also be able to talk about culture of uh, economics and, and business. This is a good example of a festival where, which would not have been possible, and I, I think many other things would not have been possible without, without, without very heavy uh, you know, involvement in, 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 uh, of business. And we expect this from each other. I, think, I, think, I believe in the invisible hand, but not of the markets, but of the society. There is something in the structure of the society that keeps us regulating somehow in being able to go forward. So when uh, people become too corporate, too business-like, a generation of hippies is born. When we are too bureaucratic, Kafka starts to be, you know, pretty, pretty on, on the edge. He fights a war with, with bureaucracy, with a strike of a pen. Um, sometimes art helps business. Sometimes, polit sometimes art helps politics. In 1989, it was art scenery that perhaps got our politics or started the politics that unstuck it from, from a certain place. So uh, there is nothing really in capitalism that limits you to be a good person. This is the key. If you want to, I mean, uh, so, so, so to me, capitalism system is a basic understanding which gives us opportunity to build on it, like freedom. Freedom isn't a point of life. Freedom is a beginning where you should, okay, now I'm free, but I want to go there and there and there and there and there. Democracy isn't the solution. Democracy is a beginning. So we should also make sure, and that's why I like these suggestions, that we should also nature and cater to the uh, culture of economics, also the culture of culture. I mean, culture isn't holy per se. Culture, very many, very often times, culture was a slave of ideology during the communist regime, during, during, during all regimes, during the Nazi regimes. It was the ideologists first who used art to show that our culture is better than our neighbors and they're not even really human beings because they don't uh, listen to Wagner uh, with the same sort of a passion. So culture can also be uncultured, you know. So, so, um, so this striving, and this is the wonderful thing about capitalism, that capitalism and democracy, well, maybe capitalism more than democracy, is actually very happy to be transformed and to be critiqued. Unlike all other systems, this system admits that it's in deep shit and wants to do something about it. And why do we always say about democracy that it's not a very good system, but it's the best one we have? And we never think about that about capitalism. It's also really, you know, system that's comme ci, comme ça. Not always do the markets work. I mean, very often I would say if I'd be pressed up against the wall and asked how many times markets work, it's impossible to put it in numbers. But I would say 60 to 80 percent of the times market work. 20 percent, you got famines, you have people mis I mean, system not because of human greed, but because of the system's uh, inability to, to learn. My last point is uh, the spirit is really willing. When I was listening to you, just realizing that the Paris Agreement, which was the most brilliant agreement going in, in the direction that you've pointed, that was not stalled by businesses. Businesses were actually pretty fine with it. It was stalled by, you know, we have the name, you know, by Donald Trump, by a, a freely elected American, American president. So it's, and, and Trump's not here forever. So my advice is, yeah, it's, of course, let's try to improve the system, but never in a way as to, as to throw it away. Our repairs have to be very, very gentle. Good night. So, so if I look at the, uh, the purest definition of capitalism, uh, look this up, it's, it's a system uh, where the means of production and commerce are not owned by the government. They're owned by individuals, private individuals. And that's the strictest. And so these little 
stalls out here, those are capitalistic. My grandson has a lemonade stand. He's a capitalist because he owns it himself. It's not, you know, the government doesn't own it. What we have today is what I call predatory capitalism, which has created this death economy. And what it has done, I think, is turned the system on its head. So not only does government, at least in the United States and much of the world, government does not own business. Business owns the government. And that's a huge difference. So we know that in the United States, nobody gets elected to president of the United States without huge support from corporations, from business. And uh, Trump's a great example of that. Uh, but, but so was Clinton in many respects. So, so really what's happened is that capitalism has been turned on its head. The definition has been reversed. So it's not only that government doesn't own business, but today business owns government. And I think what you're talking about with those two countries you were talking about, the laws couldn't be exactly the same because you wouldn't have had one where you had uh, not, what I interpret as an autocratic leadership and the other where you had more of a democratic leadership. But I think we really have to look closely at, at when, what, what does it mean when big business controls government? And, you know, we can call that fascism or oligarchy. There's many different terms there's, for it. There's no, no debate about Gentlemen, that. I'm, I'm sorry I got the signals that we are running out of time. I'm sure this, we just, we this just discussion started. would be wonderful. You had uh, another discussion uh, uh, with the beer last night, and it took several hours. So uh, I encourage it. Uh, we should have actually started the debate from where we left our conversation <laughs> yesterday, because we were already in the conclusion anyway, part. I would so. like to thank John Perkins and Tomasz Sedlacek. Thank you.